Good morning, everyone. Selamat pagi. Welcome to the CBSUA and UMK Joint International Webinar on Academic, Economic, and Cultural Undertakings 2020. So this is the first of the series of webinars hosted by Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Philippines, and Universitas Muria Kudus, Indonesia. Before we start our program, let me first give you the guidelines to follow for this webinar. During this webinar, we have two types of participation. First are the actors who are inside the Google Meeting, and second are participants joining via live streaming. So reactors in the Google Classroom meeting are requested to mute their microphone and they may turn off their video or camera. After the discussion of our two resource persons, questions and clarifications will be answered. For our reactors, they will give their questions and or clarifications after the discussion. They will be allowed to unmute their microphone once their names are called for their reactions. For our participants via live streaming, they can send their questions and or clarifications to our Google form. You can access the Google form using the link flashed on your screens. At the end of the webinar, participants and reactors must submit an evaluation. E certificates will be issued only to registered participants who will accomplish the post webinar evaluation, which can be accessed through the link sent to your email. Please double check submitted information as the training organizer will not be responsible for any incorrect data submitted. I guess everyone is ready for our first webinar for this series of undertakings. So now, let me give you an overview. As the current situation of our countries in the Southeast Asian region, our educational system is now facing challenges in our curriculum and instruction. But this cannot hinder our goal, which is to deliver quality education to our students. This pandemic and shift in the delivery of education is not a setback, but an opportunity for us to enhance and upscale our curriculum and instruction. So this activity aims to help to ensure the culture of excellence in the areas of curriculum and instruction amidst this pandemic and shift in the educational system. This also seeks to strengthen the linkage between CBSUA and other Southeast Asian universities through the exchange and transfer of knowledge, technologies, and best practices in instruction, research, and extension. This is through the efforts of the presidents of CBSUA and UMK and of the people behind this activity. This webinar seeks to help ensure quality and excellence in the curriculum and instruction amidst the current health crisis. Share some of the pedagogical approaches and instrumental in ensuring quality and excellence in curriculum and instruction. Improve the pedagogical strategies and approaches of the extension participants, especially in this time of pandemic. Fourth, enhance skills and competencies that may help the participants in coming up with an appropriate instructional material that could be used in different platforms or modalities in the delivery of instruction and provide an avenue for further collaboration among higher education institutions in the Southeast Asia. And now, let me walk you through the program for today's webinar. First is the preliminaries to be followed by our resource person on pandemic-proof pedagogical approaches in teaching and Andhra pedagogical orientation as pedagogical teaching approaches in COVID pandemic, and to give our participants chance to ask their questions and clarifications, we'll have the open forum. So that's it, and I will not keep you waiting. Let's have our first topic on pandemic-proof pedagogical approaches in teaching. Let me introduce to you our resource person. Our resource person believes that the road to success is always under construction. He knows very well that everything in life can be achieved once persistence, fortitude, mind, heart, hand, and spirit are, pour, are put into action to realize the goal. He finished his bachelor's degree in elementary education where he specialized in science and health at 
in the University of Nueva Cáceres, Naga City, Philippines, in March 2006, where he also awarded for his service and for his contribution as an active student leader during his stay at the university. It was on November 17, 2015, when he finished his master's degree in agricultural e education at CBSUA. He was also awarded President's List for Excellence Academic Performance and Best Thesis. On March 17, 2017, he was conferred with Pagkilala Award, the highest and most prestigious award being given to graduate school students for his consistent excellent academic performance and pursuit for the degree in Doctor of Philosophy in Development Education and for demonstrating exemplary leadership among students in the graduate school. On April 26, 2019, he was conferred with Doctor of Philosophy in Development Education. He was also awarded President's List for Excellent Academic Performance. In January 2012, he was appointed as Teacher 1 at Julian B. Meleton Elementary School, Division of Naga City, where he handled Grade 6 English and Mathematics classes. In October 7, 2017, he transferred to Central Bicol State University of Agriculture. Presently, he serves as the chairperson of the Elementary Education Program and still handles professional courses at College of Development Education and the Graduate School of CBSUA. He also attended and presented his study in various local, national, and international seminars, workshops, and fora on education and research. He had been a coordinator and a proponent of a number of local seminars, workshops, and fora on education and research relative to being a DepEd teacher once, and now a faculty member of the CBSA College of Development Education. He also served as a resource person or speaker on teaching pedagogy, hosting and public speaking, and action researches in the various in-service training sponsored by schools at DepEd Naga and Dep at Camarinesur. Now, let's welcome Dr. Christopher B. Dasser from Central Bicol State University of Agriculture, Philippines. Good, Good morning, morning, sir. Marhay na. Maganda, magandang umaga, uh, Pilipinas. Salamat pagi, Indonesia. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Director Louis Razal, for the kind introduction. I am tasked today to deliver a talk on pandemic-proof pedagogies. Let me start by emphasizing what we are experiencing right now. We are in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic, which continuously distorts the way we live. I want to believe this pandemic brings out the best and the worst in us. What do we do with our bests? We keep them and we keep on improving. And how about the worst in us? I believe in this pandemic, we turn them into opportunities. One particular opportunity is that this pandemic provide us time to assess the way we deliver our services as teachers. And that includes the time we should allot or provide for pedagogies as this current situation catapults us away from our comfort zones. We become restless, but still hopeful. But as teachers, we cannot stop. Learning must go on. Learning must continue. With that in mind, allow me to realize the objectives I set for this particular webinar. On your screen, after 30 minutes, the participants will be able to first review some pedagogies. Second, to reintroduce to you PPAC framework and how and as to how it is used in the classroom and identify the characteristics of pandemic proof pedagogies. And with that in mind, may I start? For common understanding, uh, pedagogy simply means the teaching of children because as you all know for for almost 12 years or 13 years or so I've been working with children so this is part of the things that I would like to share also to, to the rest of you 
who are tuning in right now. And as we define pedagogy, it simply means the approach to teaching, which refers to theory and practice of learning, and how this process influences and is influenced by the social, political, and psychological development of learners. And since, and since we now have the common understanding of what pedagogy is all about, let me proceed to the review of some of the pedagogies I am talking about and what makes them pandemic proof. First, let me start with behaviorism. Edward Thorndike initially proposed that humans and animals acquire behaviors through the association of stimuli and responses. He advanced two laws of learning to explain why behaviors occur the way they do. First one is the law of effect, specifies that any time a behavior is followed by a pleasant outcome, that behavior is likely to recur. The law of exercise, on the other hand, states that the more a stimulus is connected with a response, the stronger the link between the two are made. So we link, of course, the effect and it's uh, the way children exercise this one. And then Ivan Pavlo, a groundbreaking work on classical conditioning, also provided an observable way to study behavior. Although most psychologists agree that neither Thorndike nor Pavlo were strict behaviorists, their work paved the way for the emergence of behaviorism and looking into account what we would like to do. What does behaviorism uh, implies in the classroom? So there are teachers who believe that they are the center of the learning and of course teaching environment. If that is the case, then that means to say, we allow okay, ourselves to be the, the leader of the classroom or taking the lead, telling our students what to learn basically and what to do. So some sort of, of this is being uh, emphasized in the classroom once a particular teacher believes in behaviorism, okay? Moving on to the next one is liberationism. What does it do? Uh, prayer talks about the fallacy of looking at education system like a bank. So a large repository where students come to withdraw the knowledge they need for life. Knowledge for prairie and for all of those who believe in liberationism. Knowledge is not a set of commodity that is passed from the teachers to students. Students must construct knowledge from knowledge that they already possess, unlike behaviorism. In behaviorism, the teacher takes the major role of putting or inputting to the minds of children. But in, liberation, in liberationism, it's the other way around. Teachers must learn how the students understand the world so that the teacher understand how the student can learn. So liberationism offers a different view, different from behaviorism. On the next pedagogy, we have social constructivism. Vygotsky's theory states that knowledge is co-constructed and that individuals learn from one another. So you see the dynamics from behaviorism to liberationism, we are moving forward to constructivism, which is highlighting the fact that knowledge is co-constructed and that individuals learn from one another. It is called social constructivist theory because Vygotsky's opinion on the learner must be engaged in the learning process. There should be an active engagement of students in the whole teaching learning process. Learning happens 
with the assistance of other people, and that includes us, teachers, and other most significant people in the lives of our learners. Thus, contributing to the social aspects of the theory, a fundamental theory, um, aspect of Vygotsky's theory is the zone of proximal development where, in fact, in the Philippines, um, the K-12 program is anchored on this particular um, pedagogy, which is under Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. This is a range of tasks that are too difficult for an individual to master alone. That's where our job our expertise as teachers will come in, okay? So that's about social constructivism. Moving on, on the last pedagogy, connectivism, and connectivism was introduced in the mid-2000s. It is an idea based on the premise that knowledge exists within systems and that is acquired by individuals who interact collaboratively within activities related to that knowledge. Whether you view con collectivism as a learning theory or a pedagogical view, the movement has significant connections to behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. Marcy Perkins call in her book, psychology of learning for instruction. She defines learning as a persisting change in human performance or performance potential, which must come about as a result of learner's experience. Not only that, one important factor is that is added is interaction with the world, interaction with the world. That's where connectivism will come into full view. From a learner-centered teaching perspective, connectivism provides opportunities for students to make choices, the power of making choice about what he or she would like to learn. Now, connectivism promotes group collaboration. We love this one. We love collaborating. What we are doing right now is a form of collaboration and of course discussion, allowing for different viewpoints and perspective to aid in, very, very important nowadays, problem solving, decision making, and making sense of information. We do away with fake news. What do we do with fake news? We fact checked. And that is part of making sense of what we have in terms of information overload that is happening at the very moment. There you go, friends. Uh, having reviewed of some of the sought after pedagogies, we have behaviorism, of course, we have liberationism, social constructivism, and connectivism. Specifically, I would like to point out connectivism, which highlights the use of technology, specifically the internet. May I reintroduce you to this framework which emphasizes the interplay, the beautiful interplay of the three, uh, of the three different uh, knowledge we have as teachers. So on screen is the TPAC framework. I'd like to, to focus on the TPAC framework, okay? The TPAC framework was introduced by Punya Mishra and Matthew J. Kohler of Michigan State University in 2006. And with it, they identified three primary forms of knowledge. We have content knowledge. And I do believe, I want to believe all of us here have the mastery of this, the content, the very soul, the very purpose why we are teachers. We are teachers because primarily of the content knowledge we have. Second, the pedag uh, pedagogical knowledge. That's why we are putting, we are spending our time to be together because we would like to reinforce our pedagogical knowledge by reviewing some of this ped uh, pedagogical uh, knowledge or pedagogies, which said to be pandemic proof. And then, of course, 
we cannot do away with this technological knowledge. So looking at the framework, the center of the diagram, otherwise known as the TPAC, represents a full understanding of how to teach, how to teach, how to teach with technology, specifically that we are under pandemic. We are not just using the internet for the sake of teaching, but I believe on a very personal note, there is some sort of exploiting the technology that we have, okay? Now keep in mind that this is not the same as having knowledge of each of the three primary concepts. We are not taking um, pedagogical content, your content knowledge, your pedagogical knowledge, and your technological knowledge separate. Okay, this is an interplay of those three knowledge that we have as teachers. Of course, instead, I would like to share that and to point out that TPAC is to understand. TPAC is to understand how to use technology to teach concepts in a way that it enhances student learning experience. We are now at the point wherein we would like to enhance student learning experiences. We are out of our comfort zones. We are not in the classroom anymore. So how do we make learning more meaningful with the use of this TPAC framework? Let's say, for example, what you deliver content to your student, what we deliver usually is the content, and then via learning management systems. In our case, at the in our case, at the Central Biko State University of Agriculture, we are making use of a learning management learning management system, which is um, Moodle. So that's our bloodline. Okay, we will heavily depending on our LMS for us to continuously deliver our services to our students. But even if we, okay, if we um sufficient knowledge if we have sufficient uh, sufficient knowledge of our content we are teaching and the use of our lms we might still subject our student to an entire online um, course of text-based pdfs we can just simply send to our students um learning links but the question is or pdfs for that matter but the question is are we enhancing learning experience per se so that is a question i am posting to everyone but with the help of this tpac framework we'll see the beautiful interplay of our content knowledge our pedagogical knowledge and our technological knowledge in one in one particular viewpoint while this inadequate display of both content and technological knowledge, you could argue that it is not enhancing the learning experience. Let's say if a teacher would like to focus on content, I believe we are not enhancing students' learning experience. Maybe we are just after pedagogical knowledge. That alone does not support or does not imply or upholds or upholds basically um, enriching learning experience for our students. So we have to take note of the three interplaying uh, components, okay? And in saying, if we teachers recognize how our content could be presented in more interactive and engaging digital mediums like, we are using already this, some of you, are already experts in using video, classroom discussions, games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you knew how to make that happen via your LMS. So maybe your Google Classrooms for that matter. Then you just leveled up to technological content knowledge. So my friends, I would like you to reconsider, okay? Reconsider when we plan our activities for our students, or we are at the moment I'm making our modules or our lesson plan for that matter, I am urging everyone to reconsider this TPAC framework. 
Okay, moving on. Now that we are done reviewing some of the most important pedagogies, you were also introduced or some, or for some reintroduced to the TPAC framework, it's time to provide you with a guide which help us identify which pedagogy is said to be pandemic proof. I will be sharing nine characteristics of a pandemic proof pedagogy based on a study conducted by Chris Husbands and Joe Purse in 2012. The first one is that they give serious considerations to pupil's voice. Nowadays, we cannot do away with that. Provide, allow our students to have their say as we plan our, um, as we plan the things that uh, we do in the classroom or maybe in the virtual classroom. It is important that we listen to them about their concerns in the classroom specifically on how they will learn better. Now, if you are a teacher and you are upholding a particular pedagogy for, for teaching or for learning and you consider the voice of your students and I am sure that whatever pedagogy you are upholding, that is pandemic proof. That's one. Second, pedagogies that depend on behavior. When I, when I say behavior, I pertain to what teachers do, what we do as teachers. Knowledge and understanding that pertains to what teachers know. Earlier, I was talking about content knowledge. And of course, we cannot do away with our beliefs. And for this context, I am referring to why teachers act as they do. Yes, we agree that learners should be put at the center of any educational decision that we make. And as teachers, the success of any teaching learning activity still depends on the conscious effort we make as teachers in order for our learners to be the center of every decision we make. We, the teachers, are as important as the learners we have. May I repeat that? I would like to emphasize that. We, the teachers, are as important as the learners we have. So I would like you to take pride on that. The next is that pedagogies involve clear thinking about longer term learning outcomes as well as short term goals. A pedagogy that allows us to plan and make adjustments as the need arises, it is a clear indicator that particular pedagogy is pandemic proof Yes, I understand. We have the plan. Okay? By all means, we will follow the plan. Uh uh. We should be cautious. Because if we do that, we are adhering to a particular pedagogy that doesn't allow us not to do that. A pedagogy that is said to be pandemic proof is a pedagogy that allows us to make some changes, alteration, modification adjustments my dear friends we make adjustments on the next slide on to the next pedagogy that is built on pupils prior learning and experience we always say this we always hear this but are we putting much attention to this prior learning experience consider implementing a pedagogy that allows us teachers to bank on learners' experiences. This means that teachers should know the learners through their immediate family members. That's why we do dialogues. We talk to parents. We call them from time to time because we would like to know our students better. We talk to their friends. We talk to their most significant people around them. This means that teachers should know the learners through their immediate environment. And by this, we can plan working on their authentic experiences 
Yes, I believe we observe in the classroom, but the, ch the real challenge now is we are not in the physical classroom, my friends. We are in a virtual classroom. How do we know our students by heart? That is another challenge for us. But as teachers, we can do something to get to know better our students and bank on their learning experiences. Next on to the next slide, basically is pandemic-proof pedagogies involve scaffolding. We always hear the word scaffolding and the phrase scaffolding of pupils' learning. This pertains to the importance of the child's interaction. We are highlighting interaction with the world. That's why we have constructivism. We have social constructivism. We have connectivism. Basically, we would like our children to view the very important thing that is interacting with the world. Okay? And constructivist theories tend to be dominant in research with an emphasis on the importance of discussion, dialogue, social context of learning, and teacher's ability. So that's where we come in. Teacher's ability to scaffold students' learning beyond their current stage of understanding. I always believe in knowing where your students are at and what they can do at the moment. That's why we can scaffold based on what they do, based on what they know, and based on what they can still do. So that's the power of scaffolding. Next, to move on, a pedagogy that is said to be pandemic proof involves a range of techniques. And that includes whole class, that's a bit of a challenge. We are in a virtual classroom, but Google, Google Classroom and other platforms are doing, are capable of having breakout sessions. But how about whole class? How can we post collaboration wherein we are in a virtual classroom? Okay? Now, in that being said, it is the combination of a pedagogic strategies in their employment in the combination that makes for success. And this in turn has implications for teacher's ability. So I always keep on saying teacher's ability, teacher's ability. Yes, we are also sharing the limelight because I still do believe the success of every learning activity still depends on teacher's ability to plan, to make adjustments, and to pursue whatever the plan is after making such adjustments, okay? And it is rather that with careful planning, good organization, and considered implementation, they can be used effectively as part of the range of strategies. So consider this. If you would like to pinpoint what or what makes a pedagogy pandemic proof, please consider that pedagogies that involve a range of techniques is said to be pandemic proof. Now, next, pedagogies that focus on developing higher order thinking and metacognition. Uh, meta meta okay? I believe you have attended webinars, seminars, and if it's about pedagogy, if it's about children's learning, or in the case of adult, adult learning, we cannot do a way of developing higher order thinking skills. Are we not thinking anymore? Why do we put so much emphasis on higher order thinking skill and metacognition? Because we have to. Making good use of dialogue and questioning in order to do so. So as teachers, we have the power. We make use of dialogue. We create something to talk about so that children, adults, learners can make their contribution. 
And of course, basically, the art of questioning relies much more to us as teachers. The power relies to us if we know how to make good questions. Questions that develops higher order thinking skills. This highlights the importance of good questioning, as I have said, that allows learner to think and see the relationships of questions previously asked to what is being asked. So take note of that. The power of questioning, the power of creating something to talk about. And I believe something to talk about that is good, that will bring out the best in each and every learner in the virtual classroom we have at the moment. Next, pedagogies that embed assessment for learning. For more important, that assessment is feedback. So you see the interplay, the movement, the dynamics in the classroom or in a virtual classroom. We are also placing a pandemic-proof pedagogy is upholding assessment assessment that brings feedback which we could teachers make use to make sound educational decision when you post a question and a particular learner answers that is a feedback and we make use of this as to, to scaffold and to pinpoint where the student is at and as teachers we do something about it we redirect them we encourage them to participate, okay, based on what they already know. And when a particular student answers a question via LMS, that gives you already the idea that basically a leveling up where the students are at. And then you make a sound decision. What do I do? I identify that, you know, my students are not learning the way I expect them to learn. Then what do you do? It's all up to you. But what is far more important is you do something about it. On the next one, pedagogies that uphold inclusivity. Big word. Inclusivity. And take diverse needs of range of learners as well as matters of student equity how do we do this in this time of pandemic we're talking about being inclusive highlighting student equity okay it is a bit of a challenge for teachers to do away with our biases and be more welcoming of all types of learning maybe the apprehension springs from not fully not not fully knowing what to do with today's varied types of learning. Well, what do we do with that? We have to work on it by asking for assistance to those who are experts in, their, in this particular field. Now, going back to inclusivity, that means to say accepting all types of varied learners we have, and the question in the Philippines, my friends, is internet connectivity, the equal access to education. Well, at CBSUA, we are doing our very, very best to address that. There are, you know, many challenges, but the administration, with all of our authorities here, are doing their best to address this inclusivity and equality in equity in terms of quality education and access to education per se. With all of those, we now come to the end of my talk, my friends. Let me end this by sharing what I personally believe in which is, for me, the key to success in any academic undertaking is for teachers like us to decipher which ones will be the most appropriate pedagogies to be upheld. Of course, putting into utmost consideration our learners. 
So whatever they are, as long as they serve the purpose for both parties, both for teachers and learners, I believe we should give them a go. Thank you very much. My references and resources, which I am not taking any form of ownership in one way or another, and may I express my full acknowledgement to all the originators and creators of the content I shared with you for the purpose of sharing to the rest of you. Thank you very much. Maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Terima kasih, Indonesia. Thank you very much po. Maraming maraming salamat. And to God be the glory. Thank you. Salamat, Dr. Deser. Salamat, Dr. Deser. Thank you for introducing to us the different teaching approaches that's said to be pandemic-proof pedagogies and the TPAC framework which reminds us that three things must be considered such as technological, pedagogical, and content knowledges for us to deliver holistic with quality continuous education having the different characteristic of pandemic-proof pedagogies even in times of pandemic or crisis. And now, to continue with our program, let me introduce to you our next resource person to share his expertise to us on the topic Andhra Pedagogical Orientation as Pedagogical Teaching Approaches in COVID Pandemic. Our resource person is from Kaliwungu Kudus, Indonesia. He earned his degrees in English Education and Literature at Universitas de Punegoro Semarang and Universitas Negeri Semarang. He is currently a professor in English at Universitas Muria Kudus, Indonesia, and he held positions as Head of English Education Department, Head of English Education Department Laboratory, First Assistant to Dean of Teacher Training and Education Faculty, Head of Character Building Center. He is in also involved in series of researches and publication activities. Now, let's welcome Dr. Rismianto SSMPD from Universitas Muria Kudus, Indonesia. Sir, good morning. Okay, good morning. Okay, uh, thank you for the time. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in particular, Mr. Lugi Lorenzo Razel as the moderator, and also Mr. Dr. Christopher Deser, uh, who has uh, very well presented uh, his materials on uh, pedagogical teaching approaches. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm here going to present a topic exactly entitled Andhra Pedagogical Orientation as Pedagogical Teaching Approaches in COVID-19 Pandemic. My presentation or my topic today, I guess, is very closely related to what Mr. Christopher Deser already presented. We are both talking about, uh, what is it, the uh, pedagogical teaching uh, approaches, but me, I, I, I will be more to present uh, the correlation or the relationship between uh, teaching orientation covering andragogy and pedagogy and uh, the pedagogical approaches uh, re uh, covering 
several types or several categories of uh, uh, what is it uh, pedagogical teaching approaches like behaviorism and constructivism. Okay, uh, I will also present a result of a mini research I did in my department in English education department of Moria Kudus University. I will report the teaching strategies used by my colleagues, the lecturers in English education department during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, but before reporting, before presenting the result of the mini research, I will uh, proceed my presentation by presenting some related uh, points. Okay, seeing to uh, the title, so we have uh, several important keywords here. We have teaching orientations uh, broken down into andragogy and pedagogy. And then we have teaching approach. Here is pedagogy. We, we also have the word pedagogy here as a pedagogical teaching approach. And the setting, the setting is a uh, time signal. Uh, we are now in COVID-19 pandemic. Well, uh, as, uh, as an introduction, I will say that the situation in general education in the world has changed since the first semester of 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, forcing teachers and students to stay at home. The COVID-19 pandemic has created the largest disruption of education systems in history, affecting nearly 1.6 billion learners in more than 190 countries and all continents. Closures of schools and other learning spaces have impacted 94% of the world's student population up to 99% in low and lower middle income countries. But whatever worse, how worse the condition is, the show must go on. The education, the learning, and also the teaching must keep on going. Then this condition results in the shift of teaching form from the offline teaching form to the online one. Now, here, there are various platforms of online teachings applied. Okay, as a review of related literature, I will uh, present some points. And first point is pedagogical teaching approaches. So pedagogical teaching approach is defined simply as the method and practice of teaching. Now, here I have similarities. I have a relation with what Mr. Christopher Desser already presented. When discussing pedagogical teaching approaches in e-learning, we usually end up with or uh, in debating instructivist and also uh, constructivist ways of doing things. I will focus on presenting the main pedagogical teaching approaches uh, according to Bjork. 2014. According to him, there are three main pedagogical teaching approaches that are instructivism or behaviorism, 
constructivism and also socio constructivism. As the first is instructivism or behaviorism. It is a traditional way of education delivery in which a good teacher diseases, diseases out the information in well-structured chunks using didactic skills. The main way of communication is one way. When students communicate with the teacher, it usually is in response to control questions posed by the teacher. The teacher knows the answer. She or he has the correct answer of face it. The teacher also controls what is delivered and decides pacing and process. We therefore call this approach as teacher-centered. The student studies for the sake of studying or rather the, for the exam in a classroom or school setting. Whereas the second is constructivism. Teaching and learning process with active learners who can construct knowledge themselves based on what they already know. The main tasks here are processing and understanding of information, making sense of the surrounding world. And then the learner has a clear responsibility for his or her own learning. It is the opposite of instructivism or behaviorism that these that the approach is therefore considered as learner-centered. The approach is often problem-based learning. And then the last is the social constructivism. It is also called socio-cultural pedagogy. The students join a knowledge-generating community, a community of practice or COP, and in collaboration with others, solve real problems and assignments in an authentic context as a part of their study. And then the teacher will, to some extent, be a learner together with his or her students as the generic skills of collaboration, problem solving, and creating new knowledge are important goals by themselves. Well, uh, I can classify that uh, the three main pedagogical teaching approaches as teaching approaches. And the next slides will be talking about the teaching orientation uh, containing andragogy and pedagogy. Starting from the first uh, teaching orientation, andragogy. The early concepts on adult education returning to the early 1800s, Malcolm Knowles popularized andragogy in order to distinguish adult education from pedagogy or child education. And then andragogy. andragogy is an important learning orientation for adult learners. As a method orientation of teaching, andragogy treats the learner as the center while the teacher mainly acts as the facilitator. In addition, andragogy philosophically gets adult learners gain an andragogical experience on of self directions autonomy responsibility for decision resource of experience performance of social roles and immediacy of application or action in relation or in yeah in relation with uh, pedagogical teaching approaches and then we create a term, andragogical 
teaching approaches. In other words, a pedagogical teaching approaches employing andragogical teaching orientation. Actually, andragogy is not categorized into a teaching approach, but it mainly touches the level of philosophical concepts revealing the adult learners involved in the teaching and the learning process. The andragogical impacts in teaching can be found through teaching approaches. In other words, there are many teaching approaches representing and orienting to andragogy or andragogically oriented. Uh, the example of uh, andragogical teaching approach is as follows. So we have so many uh, andragogical teaching approaches. This is just some of the examples. So we have think pair share or concept test. We have case studies, we have group tests and so on. And then for pedagogy, it is terminologically the art and science of teaching children. In pedagogical orientation, students do not need to find the reasons of their learning as they rely on their teachers. In other words, in pedagogy, the teacher mainly plays a role as the center of teaching. The teacher uses proper and parental pressures and grades to reinforce the students to study. As a pedagogical teaching approaches, pedagogy is not actually categorized into a teaching approach, but it mainly touches the level of philosophical concepts revealing the uh, sorry the, the young or uh, the children involved in the teaching and learning process the pedagogical impacts in teaching can be found through the teaching approaches in other words there are many teaching approaches representing orienting representing or and orienting to pedagogy or pedagogically oriented uh, the following the following are the examples of uh, pedagogical teaching approaches Okay, and this slide uh, shows the differences between andragogy and pedagogy. For andragogy, the students get themselves to be the teacher to have responsibility for decision about curriculum, skills, acquisition, skills acquisition, teaching methodology, and uh, evaluation learning. Uh, this first characteristic can be considered as 100% uh, uh, andragogy. Whereas in pedagogy, students get the teacher to have responsibility for decisions about curriculum, skills, acquisition, teaching methodology, and also evaluation of learning. In andragogy, Student-centered approach is used, and in pedagogy, teacher-centered approach is applied. In andragogy, students' prior experience significantly influences their learning process or outcome, whereas in pedagogy, students' prior experience does not significantly influence their learning process or outcome. Again, in andragogy, students' readiness to learn appears mostly due to internal stimuli, such as an increase in salary or advanced, advancements of position. Whereas in pedagogy, students' readiness to learn appears mostly due to uh, the external stimuli, such as, uh, in, such as an increase in salary or advancement of position. And then in andragogy, students find interest in learning better than drawing specific educational subject. While in pedagogy, students are drawn to specific educational subjects rather than exploring or experiences, it's experiencing interest in learning. 
Students get negative pressures as motivation from parents, peers, and professional colleges in andragogy. And students get external negative pressures and as a motivation from parents, peers, and also professional colleges. In andragogy, it shows an alternative set of assumption about the ways adults learn. And in pedagogy, it shows a basic ideology. Finally, in uh, andragogy, it is oriented to process and it is oriented to content in pedagogy. After discussing about uh, pedagogical teaching process and andra pedagogical orientation, we have the following table. So this table uh, uh, indicates the relationship between uh, teaching orientation and also uh, pedagogical teaching approaches. So andragogy as a teaching orientation are in line with uh, the first, uh, the second and the third uh, category of pedagogical teaching approaches that are constructivism and also social constructivism, where the pedagogy here is in line with the first uh, pedagogical teaching approach, which is instructivism or behaviorism. Okay, as I said in the beginning that I also did a mini research for uh, creating this article and the problems in my mini research here is, uh, the problem in my mini research here are, the first are andragogically pedagogical teaching approaches oriented in teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. Number two, are pedagogically pedagogical teaching approaches oriented in teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. Okay, and then I have found the data and the data are teaching, the teaching strategies used by the 14 lecturers of English Education Department, Buddha Kudus University in COVID-19 pandemic. And there are approximately six teaching strategies employed, like uh, the following. So we have uh, six categories, so we have six groups of teaching uh, strategies. The first one is like this. So the first category, the teacher gives the topic of material to students, and then the teacher gives the references and the detailed material, usually in PPT or in other forms, to students. And then the students learn the material themselves, and then the teacher gives related tasks and assignment to the students. And there are, all, there are uh, three lecturers uh, uh, employing or applying this category. And this category is considered as pedagogy uh, and also related to behaviorism. The second category is like the following. Uh, the teacher gives topic of the material to the students like in the first category. The difference is the teacher gives only the references to the students, not the material, only the references. And then the student have to find and learn the materials related to the references given to the students themselves. And here there are five lecturers uh, applying this category. And this category is classified or categorized into andragogy with uh, constructivism as pedagogical teaching approaches. And then number three or the third category, the teacher gives a topic of material to the students. The teacher asks the students to find and learn the references and the material themselves. This is uh, very different from the first and also the second uh, category of teaching strategies. And there are only two lecturers applying this uh, category of teaching strategies and it is categorized into andragogical 
teaching orientation in line with uh, constructivism pedagogical teaching approach. And then number four, we have uh, the fourth category of teaching strategies. Here, the teacher gives topic of material to students. Teacher gives references and the material to student. Teacher explains the material for the students. This is uh, the very clear characteristic of pedagogy. Teacher explain the material for the students. So the students only listen, the students only receive, only accept the knowledge uh, from the teacher. So the students are the good listener. And of course, number four category of teaching strategies is categorized into pedagogy, which is in line with behaviorism as pedagogical teaching approach. And then number five, these uh, teaching strategies is especially used for uh, micro teaching class actually. So the teacher just gives the topic of material to students. The teacher gives the guideline of practice to students. The students prepare the practice and the teacher and students give feedback for the practice. Uh, there are five lecturers applying this uh, teaching strategy. And this teaching strategy is categorized into andragogy and also as pedagogical teaching approach, we have uh, constructivism. And then the last uh, teaching strategy is also categorized as andragogy. And the teaching strategies are teacher gives the topic of material to students Teacher gives brief explanation and many examples. Teacher gives exercise, exercises to practice. Students do the practice. Students prepare the practice. Okay, and this is the recap of the data. I got the data from my colleagues. There are 14 lecturers. Yeah. Okay. Now. Uh, the following slides, I guess, will be the end of my presentation. So from uh, the presentation, and then I can draw some conclusion. Number one, in our department, English education department, both categories of teaching strategies considered as andragogical teaching approaches and also pedagogical teaching approaches are uh, oriented in teaching during 19 pandemic era. So both, both andragogical teaching approach and also uh, pedagogical teaching approach are all used or applied in our department during this uh, pandemic. And then number two, there are four teaching strategies. Uh, number two, number three, number five, and also number six, considered as andragogical teaching approaches and oriented in teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. Number three, there are two teaching strategies, number one and number four, considered as pedagogical teaching approach and oriented in teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. Then number four, there are eight lecturers or about 57% lecturers applying only andragogical, pedagogical teaching approach in their teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. And number five, there are two lecturers or 14% lecturers applying only pedagogical pedagogical teaching approach in their teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. And there are four lecturers or 29% of lecturers applying both andragogical pedagogical teaching approaches and also pedagogical pedagogical teaching approaches in 
their teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era. Number seven, referring to point number six, it can be stated that there are 12 or 86 percent of lecturers playing undergraduate pedagogical teaching approach and only two or 14 percent lecturers applying uh, pedagogical pedagogical teaching approaches in their teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era and or there are eight or seven of 57 lecturers 57 percent lecturers applying undergraduate pedagogical teaching approach and six lecturers or 40 three percent lecturers applying pedagogical pedagogical teaching approach in their teaching uh, during COVID-19 pandemic era. And we know that in university, uh, the appropriate teaching orientation is of course, uh, andragogical teaching orientation, not the pedagogical teaching orientation, but my colleagues still use both of them. Mm -hmm. I guess they have their own considerations. For example, the lecturers who prefer using uh, andragogical pedagogical teaching approaches, which is appropriate for adult learners, to uh, pedagogical pedagogical teaching approaches, which is more appropriate for teaching young learners or children in teaching during COVID-19 pandemic era, they, it is because they consider that the difficulty level of courses they teach is still in range of the student's competency so that the passing grade achievement can be gained. And in opposite, the lecturers who prefer using uh, pedagogical pedagogical teaching approaches, which is appropriate for teaching uh, children or young learners, but it is used for teaching uh, the university students. It is because they consider that the difficulty level of courses that teach is still out of range of the students competency so that the passing grade achievement can be gained, especially in our university as uh, one of private universities in Indonesia the input of the new students uh, is not all in a good level of competency. So uh, once again, although we know, we, we realize that uh, andragogical teaching orientations is uh, the appropriate teaching orientation for uh, adult learners, but because of several considerations, several vectors, we still use uh, both of them, both of andragogical teaching orientation and also pedagogical teaching orientation. Okay, terima kasih and thank you. Terimikasi, Dr. Ismianto. Thank you for sharing to us your expertise on the topic and by differentiating andragogy from pedagogy and how we can employ strategies under andragogy in this time of pandemic for us to continue to deliver quality excellent education to all students. And now, to give our participants and reactors opportunity to ask their questions, We'll have now the open forum. First, our reactors will be asked to give their questions and clarifications to our resource persons, Dr. Daser and Dr. Rismeanto. To our reactors, once your name is called, kindly unmute your microphone to say your question or clarification. So again, please say, say them twice. So the flow or the sequence of the reactors is as follows. We have Philip and Talai. Ahmad Hilal Majdi, 
Ramil Espederio, Fitri Budi Suryani, we have Rolando, Ronaldo C. Briones, Dia Kurniati, Verhel P. Merania, Supri Hadi, and Atik Rok Rokhayani. And now, for our first reactor, let's have Professor Philip N. Talay. Okay, Mr. Philip Talay is experiencing some technical difficulties, so we'll proceed with our next reactor. Let's have Ahmad Hilal Majdi. Again, to our second reactor, Mr. Ahmad Hilal Majdi. Kindly mute and mute your microphone to say your question or clarification. Okay, I guess Professor Ahmad is still preparing his question or clarification. So now let's proceed with uh, Mr. Ramil Espederio from DepEd Magazine for his question or clarification. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So the, so the challenge for us today in this new normal education, I believe, is for us to facilitate or provide teaching learning environment that will conquer or resist the new normal teaching strategy. So how can we cope up with this challenge? Dr. Deser? Yes, uh, I, I heard uh, the question of Dr. Pedario. Uh, welcome, sir. He is the... Hello. Hello, yes. Soon to be public school district supervisor of Naga City Division. Now, sir, the question is, how do we cope with the challenges that we are facing? Yeah. I believe on a very personal note, the first thing to do is to accept the fact that we are in a new normal. Because once we accepted the fact that we are in the new normal, ideas will come in. Um, considering ideas that spring from our knowledge um, about pedagogies, like what do we do now? Will you be a behaviorist, constructivist, a connectivist, or you'll be all? So the question of conquering and hurdling the challenges that we have, it will basically spring from the idea that we have to accept this. Now, now, moving on, what do we do? We accept. We accept the fact that we have to, we, we, we know that at the moment, maybe we still lack the technological knowledge that we have, because I don't question content knowledge. We know that. I do not Maybe I cannot question pedagogical knowledge of a particular teacher, but to cope with is opening ourselves to idea that we have to strengthen our technological knowledge, our competence. But in doing so, we are in CBSA and other higher education institutions. They are basically DepEd. I've seen what DepEd did in the past few months. Basically, they are crash, um, crash coursing, um, anything that is possible to, to help us cope with the challenges we are facing in terms of hurling our challenges um, that we face as we basically put our feet to the battlefield, which is not very physical, it's virtual. So I believe the first thing to do is to accept the fact that we are already in a new normal, Second, do something about the acceptance. It doesn't end with accepting or with acceptance. Do something about it. Help will come as long as you are open to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deser. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Dr. Deser. And now for the question of Sir Piderio, we have Dr. Rismianto. Okay. Uh, so, if the question is about how to cope with uh, the coming of the new normal, so here I have several uh, anticipations. Number one is we have to pay attention 
to the result or the achievement of the students for the last semester in the pandemic era, if uh, the result or the achievement of the students are in a good category, so we can continue uh, the teaching strategies, whether andragogy or pedagogy, which make the students to achieve or to get uh, the good scores or the good achievement. Uh, in other words, if andragogy, which is applied in the last semester, does not result in a good achievement, so we have to change into uh, the pedagogy. And uh, otherwise, if we see that the uh, the pedagogy is appropriate for yeah teaching the student, we we keep on using it, and the platform is still used the the online platform. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, Dr. Ismianto, and to Dr. Pedero, thank you so much for your question. And now for our second reactor, we have Professor Philip Entalay. Professor Talai just posted his question on the chat box, so let me read it to you. So the question of Sir Philip is, what is the best assessment form in its pedagogical approaches for us to gauge student learning? Again, what is the best assessment form in each pedagogical approach for us to gauge student learning? Okay. Sir thank, Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Sir Louis. And thank you uh, to Sir uh, Philip Talai for the question. Now, the, the question is ge geared toward assessment. And based on the discussion I have had earlier, um, in terms of assessment. Basically, that's one key factor that we will look into as teachers if we would like to pinpoint what makes a pedagogy pandemic proof. Does it highlight um, basically varied forms of assessment? The question is best assessment to do. I am going back to my experience in the field because before I transferred to higher education, I was part of the basic education and I've been working with children. What I did usually is to get to know them, what suits them, because I believe in individuality. So we believe in differentiation. So I believe this is not also different from what we are facing. So let's say we, we are moving toward virtual classroom and everything is done virtually, the same case is is to be, I mean, the, the same philosophy, philosophy will be followed. Like, to get to know the best assessment is to get to know best your children you are. I cannot say and I cannot post one particular assessment tool or assessment strategy that you could do. Why not try each and every assessment that is available? So why go authentic? Why ask children to prepare, you know, th their profile or their um, white portfolio for that matter? Is it possible to do it virtually? Now I am agreeing to what Dr. Rismianto is suggesting earlier. If andrological, okay, or andropedagogically speaking, if, if it doesn't work, try pedagogical approaches. So the bottom line here is for us teachers to impose or to, to use a particular assessment tool or strategy, you always give your students the voice that we need so that we are directed to what we can do in the form of assessment or in what particular assessment will work best with a particular set of students that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deser. And now we have Dr. Ismianto. Okay, thank you for the questions. 
Okay, I will try to answer the questions asking about what is the best assessment used in uh, the pandemic era. Actually, uh, there are several vectors we have to consider in choosing the most appropriate uh, or the best assessment, especially in Indonesia, you know, very especially in uh, my university, University of Moria Kudus. So we have to pay attention to number one, the financial vectors. If we uh, if we assign our students to make uh, to do a kind of assessment which force them to uh, what is it to use the big quota the big quota for the internet of course that will uh, what is it? that will uh, make them to spend much money and that's a very basic problem in our university and then for the submissions of the uh, the assessment of the uh, yeah the student assessment so we have also to pay attention to the security of health condition in in in, in our university and for this last semester for the last semester we uh, conduct the assessment uh, of course, in the online uh, uh, communications. And for example, for the course that I took in this semester, like a micro teaching class, micro teaching class is a course in which the students are practicing to teaching, to teach. And they have to teach students from their surroundings, uh, the students can be from their relatives and they have to shoot uh, to record, to video record their practice. And of course, uh, this a kind of assessment forces them to provide a big quota of internet and then we modify that they, they, they have to uh, upload uh, their uh, their assignment for example in youtube and then they just uh, send me the as the lecturer the link of the youtube and then we Hello. as uh, my i as a lecturer and also the other students will give feedback and yeah that will be very beneficial for the students so once again uh, at least there are there are two vectors uh, as our considerations to to uh, to choose or yeah to choose uh, the best assessment. Number one is financial factors, and also number two, security of health condition. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rismianto, and to Professor Talay. Thank you so much. And for our next reactor, we Hello, have. Thank you, sir. Lou. Thank you so much, sir. And now, for our next reactor, let's have Professor Ahmad Hilal Majdi. Okay, I guess let's proceed with our next um, reactor. We have Professor Fitri Budi Suryani. Hello, Sir Louie. Pwede yung sumingit muna? Ah, uh, yes, Sir Philip. Ayan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Da Sir and uh, Sir Rismi Yanto for answering the question. So, Kanina, uh, earlier, I have very bad connection. I'm in my office and the microphone is not working really well. Thank you very much for answering the question. Can I ask a little follow-up on that? Because I'm trying to get uh, things in my mind that assessments should also be contextualized. Ano yes. pa? I, I mean, uh, assessments should also be con contextualized for our students uh, so that um, their learnings will not be hindered by this um a challenging time. Uh, is that correct, po, sir? Thank you very much. Uh, can I answer that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Actually, Sir Philip, you got it. The term is contextualization. And where does contextualization come from? The immediate environment of our students. Because we cannot demand a particular activity to be done by our students out of their league, out of their reach, and out of their capacity. So 
looking at the cognitive level of our students plus their technological capacity at the time. Uh, I believe um, uh, Dr. Ris uh, Rismianto is giving us exact, uh, basically specific things to do uh, as, as a form of assessment because in his context, those are the things or the assessment forms which they find um, appropriate and work it. But in our context, remember, we are different. So the key is, again, to know where our students are at, their level, what are they learning, what do they need. When we consider all of these things, that's the time we can craft our assessment. In our university, in CBSUA, we uphold to the highest degree of academic freedom in terms of assessment. We are given the opportunity to do what we can do. But the bottom line is, make sure our students are learning whatever you do. We also do that in the university. In the virtual learning platform that we are having, um, I can see that teachers are basically maximizing all the available technologies that we have, even you know text messaging or bringing our lessons on air, our extensions specifically, our researches, our extension activities on air. So can we make use of that as a form of assessment? Why not? As long as it addresses and captures your objectives that you post before your students. Okay, uh, in this time of pand pandemic, I believe there is a pronouncement of leniency, leniency and full, okay, full practice of academic freedom. As long as it will not bring harm to your students, to yourself, to your colleagues, to the university, go. So the key is contextualize, individualize, or even localize. That's my, 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 my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deser. Dr. Yesmianto. Okay. <clears throat> so that's right, Dr. Uh, Professor Philip, that uh, the assessment should, should be contextualized. So, of course, in teaching process, we have uh, several things to consider. Uh, our main job is to catch the target or the purpose of teaching and learning process. And that's uh, number one, number one purpose here. Yeah. And in catching or in realizing uh, the target or purpose of teaching uh, very well, so we have to modify because of the, the, the condition, the pandemic era condition, we have to make some modifications to the teaching strategies, to the media we use. Maybe for the normal condition, we can use the, uh, the ideal, the very good uh, media, but of course we have to modif modify the media when we are in uh, this pandemic. Also, we have to, uh, to modify or, yeah, the assessment. So if the assessment in normal condition is very good, but it will not be as good as in uh, the situations. And also we have to modify the method of teaching. So contextualize here means, yeah, we still keep trying hard to catch the target or the purpose of teaching and learning, but in, uh, what is it, in the way we, we catch the purpose, we have to uh, modify the teaching strategies according to the student's context of conditional situations. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Dr. Yismianto. And again, thank you so much, Professor Talai. And now for our next reactor, we have Professor Fitri Budi Suryani. Okay, let's proceed with our next reactor. Let's have Professor Ronaldo C. Briones. Professor Briones, you may now unmute your microphone for your question or clarification. 
Okay, I guess they're still preparing for their question. So let's proceed with our next reactor, Professor Suprihadi from Universitas Moria Kudus. Okay, next we'll have Professor Verhel P. Miranya from Central Bicol State University of Agriculture. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I proceed with my question, I'd like to congratulate first Professor Desser and Professor Rismianto for their presentation. And then, moreover, before the question, I'd like to give my two takeaways from these presentations. Number one, it seems that our slow but continuing paradigm shift towards learner-centered favors the andragogical uh, teaching approaches. And then number two, our uh, technological, pedagogical, andragogical con content knowledge seems that uh, requires teachers to have all of those knowledges at the same time, uh, mm -hmm. not only being competent, but to model them in the class as uh, expressed by our professor Desser's presentation. So my question, in a very recent study in London involving 13 to 14 years old, uh, the study have shown that these students have a low anxiety level during the lockdown, which means that uh, schools give them somehow an anxiety during school days. So my question would be, how are we going to ensure that our teaching approaches, overall our teaching or our learning environment is somehow anxiety-free, quote unquote? Thank you. Dr. Deser, your answer please. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, sir, Professor Miranya, can you yes, answer the question, Bob? Uh, okay, so uh, there was a re very recent study uh, conducted in London, UK, involving 13 to 14 years old students, uh, where the anxiety level was studied during the lockdown period, and it was established that their anxiety level was low compared to their anxiety level uh, when schools are open. So my question would be, how are we going to ensure that our teaching approaches or overall our learning environment is somehow anxiety-free, quote-unquote? Thank you so much, Professor Miranya. Let's have first Dr. Esmianto. Okay. <clears throat> so to what is it, to decrease the anxiety level of the students. Of course, we have to try uh, to give uh, several consideration, I guess. Number one, of course, we, we, we have to do the learning and teaching process during this pandemic uh following uh, the protocol protocol standard uh what is it uh, ruled by the government uh, for example if the students and the teachers are still not allowed to have offline classes of course we have to uh do uh, the learning and teaching process in uh, online uh, what is it, in, 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 in online teaching and learning process. Uh, then number two, we, okay, that, uh, we know that the fact the, the, the COVID-19 is so uh, dangerous, but we still try to convince to the students that we, we should not be so panicked in, in, what is it, in facing this pandemic. So whatever the condition because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the life must go on. So uh, we must not be panicked, especially. Uh, this is very important because if we are panicked, 
everything will be uh, ruined, I think. So once again, uh, there are, according to my opinion, two points uh, 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 to consider when conducting uh, teaching and learning process, especially to uh, limit the anxiety level of the students. Number one is we still have to follow uh, the rules of uh, health protocol or system uh, conducted by the government and we, we try to uh, maintain the, 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 the panic, the, the panic situation for the students. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ismianto. And now we'll have Dr. Deser. Hello. Hello. Okay, sorry for that. I was at, out for a few minutes because I have experienced um, interconnectivity issues where I am right now. So the question is, may I, again, Sir Louis, listen to the question posted by Professor Verhel? Okay, sir. Uh, Professor Miranya, may we ask again if you can repeat your question? Okay. Uh, Hello, sir. Yes. Good, uh, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, congrats. sir. Congrats. Uh, my, my, my question actually is uh, based on a recent study conducted in London uh, involving 13 to 14 years old students. And then the study uh, have the results of the study have shown that uh, the anxiety level is somehow low or lower uh, than uh, during the lockdown than uh, during when classes are open. So seemingly that schools are offering somehow a certain anxiety level to students. Okay. So re regarding our teaching approaches and overall our learning environment, how are we going to ensure that uh, our students would experience somehow a anxiety-free, quote-unquote, learning environment. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you for that wonderful question, uh, Sir Verge. Um, I am not quite surprised with the result of the study conducted uh, in London, the recent study conducted in London, um, specifying the anxiety level of our students or their students. I believe in the Philippines, I don't know if we have the same uh, studies, but if that happens, I believe it will have the same um, result. Yes, the anxiety level is very high, not only for students. And let me share with you, even, uh, even us, teachers, professionals, we experience very high level of anxiety uh, in, in, in the process. For several months, we are... We have been experiencing that in the preparation, you know, from migrating from face-to-face -face mode of instruction. Now we are rushing, migrating ourselves to the virtual world that causes lots of anxiety level. Okay, surprisingly, that I believe that is not surprising, uh, specifically for children. I agree and I believe with the result. Now, what do we do? Now, the Commission on Higher Education and the Department of Education, they basically uh, sent um, directives regarding leniency. I believe with leniency, those, uh, this one is understandable, specifically by Professor Miranya, because in the past he's been talking about self-paced modules, preparing self-paced module. Now, with that, I believe with the recent um, issuances by the, by the Commission on Higher Education and Department of Education with Linian C, somehow that answers the, the questions on the continuously rising uh, high level of stress or anxiety that we pose. Now, what do we do as university? This will come in a very good opportunity for the university, the different offices in the university to interplay, to collaborate. We have our, um, we have basically the Office of Students um, Affairs um, offices and our guidance counselors are basically giving um, seminars, webinars to our students how to cope with the, the, the rising anxiety level. So that's one. 
So our administration basically are doing that. The Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs has basically um, sent out um, directives concerning the health and wellness both of our students and teachers. With the rising, I believe, that will also come into play the role of parents. The role of parents. That's why we are also providing series of webinars and trainings for, um, for parents and the like on how to guide their students on how to cope with this rising level of anxiety. So this is more than ever an, an opportunity for everyone, our stakeholders to work together because at the end, what are we preparing for? We are being true to our profession that even without pandemic, with the onset of pandemic, we are here to serve. I believe that's the time to do it, to show that we are working in, our, in, in the offices that we have, do something about this. How do we do it? Well, be authentically with our students. Communicate with our students. When they post a pressing concern on the use of virtual learning portal, we attend to this. At our level, if we cannot attend to this, we have our officials. And I believe I put trust to our officials that they will definitely do something about this. They have thought of this ahead of time before they basically decide to push into migration, to push for this. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Deser. And our reactors from UMK are experiencing um, interconnection problems. So we will proceed. So once again, thank you so much. Salamat, terima kasih to all for participating and to our resource persons for their expertise. And now, before we end, let me give you some reminders. Please submit your evaluation because e-certificates will be issued only to registered participants who will accomplish the post-webinar evaluation, which can be accessed through the link sent to your email. Please double check submitted information as the training organizer will not be responsible for any incorrect data submitted. Ah, okay, so before that, uh, okay, Professor Agung with, is, uh, has a question to our resource person. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So sorry for this uh, very late response. Uh, actually, I was texting uh, to the, uh, the administrator. Uh, but OK, uh, thank you very much for this chance for giving a live uh, response. I just would like to uh, address the case that I'm facing in, in uh, my classes, or maybe this may appear in general classes in, during the pandemic. That is uh, the problem of how we can uh, foster or promote collaboration or collaborative learning during the pandemic among the teachers themselves and among the students. That may appear as a problem since the physical distancing or social distancing or even uh, uh, we, we never meet uh, each other yeah, due to uh, some uh, problem like uh, maybe the remote areas and also in some areas of in, in our country, uh, there is uh, a very high level of pandemic. So they may even uh, interact or let the students go to the class. So how can we cope with this problem? A problem of collaborative or, or building collaborative learning in, uh, in turn later, uh, how to build collaboration skill during the pandemic time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deser and Dr. Rismianto for the fruitful uh, presentation. Thank you, and you are very much welcome, sir. 
Okay, so there is a question about collaboration. I personally believe in the power of collaboration. Now, how do we do it? How do we bring that forth now that we are experiencing um, this pandemic? Because the pandemic doesn't allow us to meet and to talk in a face-to-face -face manner. How do we bring that aspect in our virtual classrooms? Now, uh, I was lucky to be attending series of trainings regarding the use of the different media platforms that we have at the moment, specifically the use of Google Classroom. And in the Google Classroom, it allows us to have breakout sessions. So on the onset, now the key is for teachers to plan ahead. So that's why in our university, we were asked to, to plan ahead and we are asked to prepare the calendar of activities wherein those dates will be allotted for synchronous and those day, there are dates allotted for asynchronous, um, you know, doing of things in time of this pandemic. Now, in the synchronous time, we can make use of the Google Classroom wherein I do not just know if the VLP using Moodle will allow us to have breakout sessions, but if it does, thank you very much. But if it doesn't, we have Google Classroom, which allows for our students and our teachers to have that breakout sessions. Using that breakout session, there we are opening um, the avenue for our students to collaborate. But the key is to plan ahead. For teachers, do not just give an activity that is intended for groupings and that's it. No, we have to do it. We have to consider our internet connectivity, which I just experienced earlier. You know, teachers are not are, are not basically um, uh, exempted from having internet connectivity issues, specifically in this country. Now, what do we do? The key is always plan ahead, plan ahead. And planning ahead causes high level of anxiety, but it's all worth it. You know, let's be positive, we can do this thing. The key is plan ahead. There are platforms that will allow us as outside Google Classroom, there will be definitely a platforms will, will allow our students to collaborate. And you know, if you wish, you can even ask them to do simple researches or activities that will extend and then will showcase collaboration in this time of pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Deser. And now we have Dr. Ismianto. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Agung, uh, collaborative learning. So it is a very uh, appropriate method for uh, uh, andragogical teaching orientation and also uh, pedagogical teaching approaches. Uh, collaborative learning belongs to the logical teaching orientation and also to social constructivism of pedagogical teaching uh, approach. I do agree with Mr. Desser, Dr. Desser, that we can use uh, the platform offering the student and also the teachers uh facilities to enhance or to make our online communication easier on and more effective uh and we need to do again a modification for uh the teaching method or the teaching strategy we use for example uh, collaboration learning so we can modify the form or the system of collaborative learning itself. For example, in normal situation, we decide 
the member of the group for collaborative learning might be consisting of 10 students. So we, we can make it smaller. Maybe its group consists only two students or maximum three students. So uh, we can still do the collaborative learning, but we can also uh, obey or follow uh, the protocol error, uh, the protocol rules for anticipating the COVID-19. So, yeah, we, we still can do uh, the method, a method of learning or strategy of learning we, we, we want to do, but of course we need to modification. We need to do modification. And I guess uh, the lecturers themselves know very well the condition of uh, the class, the condition of the students, and also the condition of the society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rismianto. And again, thank you so much, uh, Professor Argo. And now, again, let me repeat my reminder to all. So please submit your evaluation because e certificates will be issued only to registered participants who will accomplish the post-webinar evaluation. So this evaluation can be accessed through the link sent to your email. And we would like to invite you to the next joint international webinar two of CBSUA and UMK this coming September to be hosted by Universitas Muria Kudus. So details on the said joint webinar will, be, will just be posted, so please keep updated. Again, we would like to thank the administrators of CBSUA and UMK, headed by Dr. Alberto Enaperi and Dr. Suparno SHMS, and also the people behind this activity. Once again, thank you to all. Terima kasih.